over to you. We are going to record this session as well so that people get the chance to watch it back via the Adopt UK website um, as well. So here we go. It's all yours. So hi everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be um, joining you for National Adoption Month, um, National Adoption Week. Um, I'm Louise and I will be sharing my own personal experience um, of being adopted and my journey so far. For some context, I'm now 31, so I feel like I've reached a very different stage of my adoption kind of journey than I was when I was um, uh, much younger in my teens. And um, the focus that I'd like to bring today is to talk about um, cultural identity, making peace with childhood trauma in adult life and the lifelong journey that comes with um, adoption, the lifelong journey of healing that comes with adoption, which I think sometimes doesn't always get um, uh, talked enough about um, the, the healing journey of um, adoptees. Um, so hopefully within the next um, 20, 20 odd minutes, I'll be able to kind of share that with you. So for context, I was born in Rwanda. Um, I was adopted at the age of three alongside my brother. Um, we aren't twins, but we know he could be. Um, a fun story is when the adoption process happened. Um, with the context of Rwanda at the time, um, we left just before the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, so some of the paperwork wasn't quite up to scratch. So as if I'm like disclosing some, like, but so it means that um for our birthdays um they had to make them up so they could go through the kind of like legal paperwork of adoption. So my birthday, and my brother's birthday, don't actually match with a whole year difference. So we don't actually know who's older and who's the youngest. So we like to joke about that sometimes, just because um. But then it doesn't really matter so much because he's my brother and our tie together has been absolutely phenomenal throughout our when we were growing up as kids and even now and even more so now now into adult life he's just my other half in a way that is like indescribable and um, so I was raised in a white family um and that has really kind of shaped my upbringing um in such a deep way and um, I am very much talking based on my own personal experience rather than um, dictating or advocating a certain type of adoption but I think a lot of the time you don't always hear about the, the experience of um, adoptees once they're older and how that kind of cultural mix has impacted them. I spent a lot of um, time whilst growing up and sometimes a lot is come up um recently in the last few years of not feeling kind of black enough to fit within the black community and whilst at the same time not really feeling white because I'm not but I've been raised within a white family and as a consequence of that within a very white environment and that has influenced in terms of influenced me in terms of which um kind of communities I feel more um connected to in many ways and um especially with the con I'm gonna contextualize this with um the current kind of Black Lives Matter and everything that's happened I have um often really struggled to really understand the lived experience of of being black and that's sometimes one of the things that is my biggest loss because of the adoption um because um i feel like i sometimes lost a lot of that kind of identity and i've tried to kind of regain it or re-pick it up in some ways um once i've been older because once you're older you have more you can kind of dictate and shape your life in a very different way than when you're like younger and under your parents' supervision. But I find I've found that culture, race, and all those conversations and um that that thing that thing that kind of roots you to your identity um is very difficult to pick it up and learn once you're older. Um and it's something that I wish so deeply that I would have had 
when I was um, growing up and trying to find myself and kind of find my identity. And um, it's meant that sometimes I really have struggled to know where I belong and where I um, fit in and um, and where I can kind of fully be myself. Um, I remember quite distinctively when I was younger, I used to, um, hopefully you'll know the reference of Tracy Beaker, it's been a while since it was on TV, but um, I'm going to specifically, obviously Tracy Beaker is um, in the care system and that's the journey that um, the show kind of highlights, but there's a specific point that will always mark me is when I'm, um, the fact that um, how much she's kind of like really kind of yearning for um to be in a home and to that um that her mum is kind of this really heroic angelical person that's going to reappear out of nowhere and take her out of foster care and they'll live happily ever after and I had that so many times when I was um little because I felt like I had been placed in a in a environment that was so unfamiliar to um what my existence was and I saw it as something that was temporary but even but whilst also seeing it as something that I didn't really know when would be the kind of end point to it which is um difficult and I kind of really held on to the idea that one day my biological parents would return, even though I knew that my biological parents wouldn't. So um, both um, my parents and extended family um, passed away due to the consequences of like the civil war, civil, civil war unrest within Rwanda. Um, so it was just me and my brother that was left within the family. We had a granddad that was left, um, but he was very old and he kind of signed us off and gave the permission for our adoption. Um, so it's just being just me and my brother. And sometimes it's very much being me and my brother against the world, um, which is absolutely beautiful because he's my best friend. He's my best friend in so many ways and he knows me and we know each other um, in such a deep way that um, I, I don't think I've ever really experienced with someone else before. Um, and in terms of how I feel about like Rwanda now, I still see, I will always see Rwanda as my home, but I see it much more as my um, spiritual home and the place where I feel the most um, at peace and a sense of grounding and connection to my roots and to my biological parents, even though my like, physical home has been the UK for most of my life. Um, I've taken a long journey to kind of really make peace with my childhood trauma. And I'm going to call it trauma because it really, that's how it felt. Um, and I think sometimes there is, is painted that once a child is adopted, um, for whatever reason that kind of their kind of um, historic historic is their um, their history in terms of why they came into adoption that the adoption is the kind of happy ever after solution um, and in many ways I can very much agree that there are cases out there that um, children that really need to be adopted um, and that they do and adoption does give a um, incredible life for them and also incredible life for the parents who are adopting but um, I found one of the things I've really struggled is that that sense of the once you get adopted the, that sense of um, that the the new life that you get means that you forget about your old old one or your pre your pre-adoption life and I think it's really important to um even though I I know that adoption is very legal <laughs> and you do become the legal parents 
of that child just as much as if you were to um, biologically give birth to a child. I'm not sure if it's the right term. Um, so I know that it's the same. Um, it's the same um, legal responsible um, kind of consequence. But I think in terms of the emotional side, there's lots of emotions that doesn't come into play when um, you have bio biological children. And that sense of identity of their former selves is really important that that is, um, that that isn't um, erased, however uh, difficult or, or um, challenging their story may be. Um, it's really important that it's still kind of a part done delicately obviously that depending to the backgrounds and things but I think erasing things can be really difficult um for me I had um um obviously like born in Rwanda then we were adopted taken to, um we moved to France because my parents are, fr are French moved to France for a few years and we moved to the UK and um during my time in, um, I think it was like secondary school, sixth form, tilting into university, people often ask me like, oh, when are you going to go back? Um, when are you going to go back? And I was like, I don't know. And I think it was only until I reached university that the need of returning home just really just was so strong. Um, and But prior to that, my parents brought um they brought the conversation about returning home but at the time I um I didn't see them as the right people for me to see that journey back um which I'm um, now looking whilst older I can really kind of feel for my mum because that must have been quite a hard moment because you want to be there for your child and kind of hold their hand through those um through those steps within their growing up as adoptees um but i think sometimes um there is um beauty in knowing that um that sometimes some things need to be discovered in other spaces other than the space that um the space that adopted you so for me i really struggled to discover and talk openly with um about um how I felt about uh Rwanda and like I've always seen my biological parents still as my parents like I've never erased them out of my vocabulary and I think that's really for me that's really important because I don't want to ever um forget them even though I can very much appreciate the that the that my adoption has resulted me in having a very different life than I would have had if I had um, stayed in Rwanda, for example. Um, and people used to tell me a lot, like, oh, you're so lucky to be adopted. Because of my back history with Rwanda, they were like, oh my God, you're so lucky to be adopted. Um, don't worry, you'll go back to Rwanda one day and you've achieved so much in your life. And this was um, 2011. I can't do the maths really quickly in terms of how old I was at, back, at that point. <laughs> but um, I had reached a point in my career where I felt really successful. However, I always felt emotionally empty and no amount of um, achievements, um, life accomplishments, like me getting a degree, me kind of like, doing really incredible jobs, nothing like filled the hole that not knowing who I was had created. So it came to a point that I couldn't ignore my um, roots and ignore my calling to Miranda, if I can call it that. And so um, that was the point that I came at a cross crossroads moment of, of having to decide whether I pushed my career because I was at the prime time to go for this incredible role that I really, really wanted. Or if I went and um, like uh, went back to Rwanda and kind of dealt with issues of the heart, um, I ended going for Rwanda instead of my career because I'm a very big believer that your career can come back at other times but matters of the heart like if you don't deal with them and if you don't um address them for what they are and head on then they will it i was reaching a point that 
that my my loneliness and my sense of confusion was actually impacting every single aspect of my life it was impacting my personal relationship my relationship i was having with partners um, how I saw my future, the relationship I had with my parents, there was so much to it. So I was like, I need to, to address this because I can't afford to put it on hold anymore. So I decided to um, return back to Rwanda, which was the most incredible, terrifying, life-changing, traumatic experience that I've ever gone through. Um, but I think some things you can't prepare for fully. I did prepare for it in the sense that I um I was in a year, I was in therapy for a whole year in the lead up to me returning. Um I was doing all this reading, trying to really kind of reaccustom myself to it, to, to the idea of returning to Rwanda. And after spending my whole lifetime kind of like daydreaming about how Rwanda would be, um, I really felt I was really prepared. And I really just needed that sense of closure because one of the things I've really struggled with is that when people lose um, any relative, your grandparents, you, you lose your parent, you lose, you lose a child, you lose like your best friend passes away of like cancer, you get given that chance to grieve and you get given that opportunity to really feel like angry or sad or mad or frustrated. You, um, people um, celebrate anniversaries with you, you attend a funeral, you have that whole, and there's a real, pur there's a real purpose to funerals, even though they're very like sombre um, moment, but they have a real purpose of closure and a real purpose of um, taking the moment to to celebrate that life and to um, make peace with how you um, how you uh, like grow forwards in the future. And one of my biggest challenge is that for me, with the circumstances of my adoption and the circumstances with everything with Rwanda at the time, that there was never that kind of space to grieve the loss of my parents and to grieve the loss of my family and to grieve the loss of my identity and um i feel like i grieve my parents like as an ongoing thing which i'm i i know that that's a very common thing for many people grief isn't just like uh a year has passed or 10 years has passed but i really had wished i really like I really miss, like there's sometimes I've, I've, I've wondered whether if I was to turn around to my friends or my parents to just be like, you know what, I really want to have a, um, a funeral for my parents, will you come, whether we will come across as a really absurd invitation, um, because, um, like, I miss my parents, like every I miss my parents like so much and there's sometimes that it's it's more it comes out much stronger than others um and um when i was uh i think much younger this was pre pre going back to rwanda i um the thought of um having children myself um felt absolutely traumatizing because um it was the idea of um bringing into the world uh, a child that would um, have the genes and reflect my biological parents um, and my biological family without me knowing exactly which traits um, they've, um, they've taken from them. So for example, um, my, um, my, uh, I have a younger sister who was, who's biologically my parents and um, when I see my younger sister, I see that she looks like my mum, she looks like my dad, she has resemblance to like cousins and that's some one of the things I really like, it's so hard to explain, I've really missed having people who look like me where you can like, oh you have your grandmother's nose <laughs> or oh you have like so and so's mannerisms and the only person that I can kind of fact check that with is my brother and so the idea of having of bringing of, of 
of being pregnant firstly and then bringing a child into the world that would resemble my parents I felt would be a very kind of like traumatic experience to basically without this to sound weird it's not giving birth to my parents but giving birth to an image of my parents without me knowing um I don't have any photos of my parents or um memories of them other than really kind of really really sketchy and um, traumatic ones and so um I really thought that it would be just too much of a traumatic experience but I'm um, since doing lots of a lot of therapy a lot of therapy um and like returning back to Rwanda and kind of making peace with um my roots um it's been beautiful to come to a place that um I feel that actually it would be a, such a um blessing to be able to um to extend the family line the, the the yeah the family line because um I really see a lot of beauty in me and my brother and um and I would love to be able to um just have my own child but to get to this point has taken a lot of like healing and to really deep deep um dig deep in myself in terms of why I was feeling that way um and um the sense of that I wouldn't be able to love a child the right way because of so many so many traumatic experiences and so many traumatic emotions that I had experienced in my childhood that I didn't want to pass on to my own child um and then adopt a child get make them go through the same thing that I've gone through and then kind of pass on my my trauma and challenges um one of the best things that I've done that I had done especially when I was like making the journey of returning back to Rwanda and when we were growing up we were um in our teens that is we were going to a center that specialized for foster a center that specialized for fostered and adopted children and families if you can find that please like go if you're a parent who with adopted children please like find that kind of those kind of communities and I think a lot of the time those communities um are really important for the parents to kind of um learn um have kind of like peer support from other parents but also for the children to be with other children who are adopted and I think one of the beauties I had with um the centre our place that we used to go to is that we didn't sit around and talk about adoption we just sat around we all knew we were adopted but it wasn't a thing it wasn't like the forefront of our identity it was a part of our identity but should we wish to talk about it then we knew that we were in an environment with people who understood our journey and um later on the the, the CEO of that organization um ended up being my therapist when I was in my late teens and that year leading up to going back to Rwanda and it was the most incredible thing because prior, prior to that I had tried to go to therapy because I had so much emotional baggage um whilst growing up but no one really understood um what I was going through I know it's gonna sound like every teenager would be like yeah I understand but I felt like no one really understood what I was going through because um adoption is such a unique um experience being an adoptive child and also a lot of the time you I I personally felt a lot of guilt for expressing certain emotions to my parents in case it came across really crap <laughs> lack of a better word so um having the space of um my therapy sessions with someone that I knew who like she um went through my the th my therapist she had adopted herself she also fostered and so she was a trained um therapist and psychologist and had felt this whole charity and so she came from a place of such deep understanding everything all the emotional challenges I kept coming to her with she was like Louise like it makes sense and I have never been in a place where someone really kind of validated my 
emotions in that way and the emotions that sometimes you're really ashamed to say because I have spent um I love my parents now um they've brought me a lot um however I will my biological parents will always be my first and um nothing in the world can erase that um even though I don't have any memories of them and um I don't have any photos of them that's one of the things that breaks my heart the most um, but they will always be a part of me. And as, the more I grow up, the more then the more I get older, and the more I'm like um, going through different life stages in my life. That I'm like I really, and I, I always say this that when I've gone through like huge upheavals in my life, that I've always felt that um, I've never believed in I've never believed in God um, or religion, but I've always believed in God and angels. And I deeply believe that um, my biological parents have been my guardian angels throughout my lifetime to get there's some things i've gone through that um even my, my best friend she's like you're like and my, after my therapist said this to me she was like adoptive children with the, your background with everything you've been through um you're not meant to survive this and survive isn't like in terms of like life or death but in terms of survive this emotionally like you're not meant to it's not that you're not meant to in terms of like what's wrong with you but in the sense there's so few that kind of come through the way that you have and are able to be so um resilient and so open to the world and so um strong so she was always like i don't know how you've done it louise because you have had everything set against you and time after time you've managed to um make it through and that is um incredible and what my therapist was able to do was together we were really able to unpack the grief and to unpack the loss and to um she really taught me that it was okay to feel um that i had lost so much um from the adoption whilst also gained a lot at the same time and i think both of them can sit by side by side sit sit side by side um for a very long time i've always saw my kind of um journey as like trauma and um and it's taken me and so it meant that actually it meant that when i used to read i i never saw it as trauma and so what it meant that when i was retelling my story to like friends or people that didn't really know me i always tell it in a very kind of like matter of fact because when it's your own story you do say it as a very matter of fact i'm very much like I was adopted, my parents passed away, um, I don't have any relatives in Miranda, um, and um, I'm here now. And people used to always like their faces used to drop <laughs> every time I used to like share like who I was in my background. And for me that was hard because I was like, well, I don't know who's on bonus, but I think um um it's um so really it's taken me a while to unpack it really as something like okay this actually this has been a traumatic thing and for me to but also come through the other side with a real sense of um overcoming and um empowerment from the whole thing and it's now like i've been back to rwanda quite a few times now um the first trip was traumatic to say the least um, because I thought it'd be a massive homecoming, um, but actually I hadn't been back to Rwanda in 20 years and when I left I was, you know, three and I came back to the age of 23 and I really was just there like, I'm just, I'm just coming home. Like that's how I was like, I've just been away for a bit <laughs> and now I'm coming home. But actually um, I had to do lots of um, unpacking and how I fit in in Rwanda whilst not um um taking away the fact that i have the life i had before and the life that i've had um from the moment i left rwanda and up until now has shaped and influenced me for the better sometimes for the worse but um i've had to really kind of um learn to fully embrace all those identities and all those um all those um connections in terms of how it kind of formed me to be kind of a version of myself today 
um, it's taken me a long time to kind of make peace with um, um, my past and to um, being able to see my scars um, as not a hindrance to my life, but actually my scars are my strength. Um, and um, he, this was years ago. So the, the year that I was returning back, I remember having a really co honest conversation with my mum. And I was like, are you upset that I'm going back to Rwanda? And she said, no, because we knew that this time would come at some point in your life. Um, and you need to do this. What we would be upset about is if you went back to Rwanda and then shut the door on um, on us completely. And in the sense of like for me to say to them, I don't need you anymore. And that was a really incredible moment because up until then, I really thought I had to choose between my Rwandanness and my um, new adopted family, that I couldn't blend the two. And now I've been able to, I mean, I can't speak, I can't speak in your own dinner. Sometimes it, it really frustrates me that I can't connect fully with um, my um, my people, so to say, but the people, um, the, the community is in, in Rwanda. But I've had to really accept that um, I will always be Rwandan, um, but I will also be French, and I will also be English because I've lived my basically my whole life in England, and that to not see that as a um as I don't have to pick a side of which identity I celebrate and like which identity I um sit alongside with. Um, in terms of kind of final points, I've really found in terms of my journey of healing that it's really not been. I think healing isn't linear you don't just go to a few therapy sessions for a year and then suddenly you've kind of wrapped your head around your adoption is something that happens at different stages and at different um by stages like obviously i had gone to rwanda um done the therapy and the therapy really helped me to get to rwanda but then there was a whole bunch of other things later on that i had to go through um, and I'll probably have to go through another set of like emotional um, navigation when I have children or I found also when um, I've gone into relationships that my emotional, um, how I deal with emotions and how I deal with people um, has been impacted by my adoption of a real sense of fear of abandonment fear of um, um, vocalising emotions to people and a fear of, um, I have a very small knit, tight knit of people that I'm really, I feel really safe with and I've really struggled to let new people in, even in my big age. <laughs> I really struggle to let people in um, because of those emotional um, challenges, but I'm learning to kind of um, acknowledge them deal with them and kind of not beat myself up um, for that at all. Um, and I really, now I'm at a place that I'm, I feel that I'm really able to kind of celebrate my journey and to really, um, um, to really feel proud that I'm still standing because it's been so hard sometimes. And um, to really, um, that I was able to turn a story that was really uh, dark to something really great. And um, my last trip to Rwanda was back in June last year, where I ran for ran in Kigali um, International Peace Marathon, and I fundraised money for the um, foundation of the First Lady of Rwanda, which is something I'd I'd always wanted to give back to Rwanda in some way, but I never really knew how. But it had I had to wait to do it in a time where I was emotionally stronger, um, because I really think that you need to heal yourself before you can go out and heal the world. And I think to think of myself when I like first went back to Rwanda, um, landed back in the landed back in the at the airport, like feeling a complete emotional mess. So where I'm, I am now to have been able to um, 
fundraise all that lots of money for the foundation and for me to be very proud of Rwanda because I think before when people were like oh where are you from I used to always be like oh I'm from Africa because it was easier to say Africa than to say Rwanda and then to see people's faces reaction when I said that and now I'm at a place where I'm, I'm really able to reclaim that as like this is my journey and this is my truth and um, I'm really proud of everything that that Rwanda has shaped me and also how my adoption has shaped me um how my adoption has shaped me as well and so um it's been this is very much more of a snapshot rather than the whole thing but I've been able to if you want to know the whole story and I've been able to share it on my um adoption not adoption blog but take me to rwanda.wordpress.com where I share my whole journey but uh, um it's been it's been a ride, but I'm really glad I'm still standing. <laughs> so, um, but thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Thank you, Louise. That's been amazing to listen to. And I think we're just really lucky to have been able to have you share even the bit of the story that you've been able to share with us um, and to be so honest and open with all of those kind of really difficult emotions and, and things that you've kind of, um, You've, you've handled in your life and I think you should be really proud that you're here and you talked about survival I think you you should be proud that you're thriving as a, a young person that's able to advocate for adoptive people in the way that you are because um, I think that's really important and for us as adoptive parents perspective or established families you know it's really important for us to hear from more people like you that can share not only your story about you know um coming from Rwanda and being adopted by a white couple because that's all very important elements of your story but just the general you know what it's like to be adopted is you know equally as important for us as, as parents to hear there's lots of comments coming in on the on the kind of chat just saying thank you very much for sharing your experiences in such a beautiful way um thanks for sharing your journey you're amazing um can you share the website link for us? What I'll do is, um, Louise, if you share details of your website with us um, after this, we'll email out to everyone that's registered for the webinar today um, as a follow-up and send the link to your website. And also we've recorded the webinar today. So we will also, um, on the page where the video gets put, we'll include a link to your website and a little bit about your story on there as well. Because I think it's really important that people can follow up and kind of come and read more about it. Um, there are a couple of questions if you're happy to um, answer questions, as well as everyone saying thank you for being so brilliant and honest and candid about your experiences. There are a couple of really interesting questions that I'd like to put to you, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one is, um, it says, uh, from Victoria, I'm, I am hopefully going to be adopting a child with mixed ethnicity. My husband and I are white. We will do everything that we can to support his ethnicity and overall identity. We have bought books, have researched and have started to try out recipes to reflect um, his ethnicity in that way. And we'll do everything that we can to help him feel like he knows his identity and feels connected to his heritage. Is there anything that would have helped you growing up to feel more connected to your roots? Um... Mm. So, uh, for me, it's um, probably being around more people that look like me, probably yeah. one of the biggest ones. Um, and either if that's done through, um, or being able to um, find people who are as closely connected to the cultural background of your child. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's probably one thing that's really important. And, um, and also one of the things that really that my mom but one of the things mom did really well is that in terms of my hair it sounds such a, like a basic thing but she took me to like a black hairdressers and she sat like for hours whilst waiting whilst they did my hair and I think and then later on she learned how to do it herself and I think that was such a small thing but such an important thing about mm. how to maintain the the um the natural um beauty of your child if that's in terms of their hair or in terms of which um, cream to use on their skin, because with um, my skin, um, I need a very different type of cream in terms to make sure that it stays like moisturized and all this kind of thing. And just so doing, um, doing research and not being scared to not know the answer because you probably 
won't because it's yeah. not something that would be your norm. Um, so I think one of the things that would help is just um, making sure there's a community around you and um, not being scared to ask questions and um, also accepting that sometimes you won't be the person to be able to provide that support for your child. That sounds like a really difficult thing to say, but I think- I think that's a really important thing to say as well though. I think, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think when you were telling your story, you talked about how when you felt ready and needed to go back to Rwanda, it wasn't, you know, going with your adoptive parents wasn't the right thing for you. And I think that's a really interesting point you made as well, that you needed space and people that could support you in that bit. But, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that your adoptive parents are going to be those people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting. Um, thank you for, for answering that one. There's a couple more questions coming through. Um, so thank you so much, um, Louise. You told your story beautifully. You mentioned therapy in adulthood. Did you have any therapy as a child? And if not, do you think it would have helped? Um, so I did have therapy as a child, but I don't think it helped. Okay. <laughs> because it was therapy, it was like general therapy, or generic, like, that sounds, it was like, yeah, it wasn't specialized therapy, basically. So it was like your general therapist. And even though, um they helped to kind of unpack some of my emotions but every time i referenced my adoption or rwanda that it was always seen as a i always felt like i was like a broken piece of china in those therapy sessions right and they didn't really know how to tackle some things and so um so yeah i did have therapy i was i didn't find it helpful and i think it was very much until i had my therapy i will always sing her praises because i think she's phenomenal it's really hard to find a good therapist my gosh but um mm -hmm. i um because she came from a place of understanding but it was never patronizing it was yeah. always um and it wasn't like oh my god i'm so sorry that you're i feel so sorry that your parents died it was just like from a place of um i want to help you in this healing journey to to come through the other end um and so it was always very empowering and also kind of re dug at the real questions to um because I sometimes I remember in those therapy sessions, I used to be like, oh, this thing happened. And then she used to go back on a point and to really dig deeper. So I think sometimes when you have someone that really understands the issue, um, they're able to ask the right questions and navigate you through it. So, mm. um, I mean, they all, all the therapists had different purposes in my life, but for what I needed in terms of my adoption, I think you need someone who has some specialist knowledge in that field. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so another question that came through, this was on the Q&A's bit, not on the chat. I'm just going to read this one. Um, thank you for sharing your story. When you say you still felt empty, despite with all your academic accomplishments, you said not knowing who you were and loss of identity. What do you mean by this? Did you feel you weren't the person you were meant to be? Or is it more about not knowing your family history? And then it goes on to say, so it's quite a long question. <laughs> um, how can adoptive parents help the children feel that sense of belonging? What would you change, if anything, about your upbringing to help with your identity? So kind of links in with what you already talked about, but I think they're, they're kind of, the, the first bit mentioning how you said you felt empty despite your academic accomplishments and not knowing who you were and loss of identity. And what did you mean by that? Um, I think, I think at the time I always, I like, labelled it as feeling empty, but I think it was just deep dive depression, <laughs> to be honest, and the, mm. but I didn't always have the kind of words to it. And I think by empty, it means that I just didn't know myself in terms, I didn't know where I came from. And um, I didn't, I, I didn't, like, I had photos, I had, you know, stories that my parents retold of like, when we went to adopt you, this happened but I couldn't visualize it myself. So I think I felt really empty in the sense that um, I, I don't know, imagine like a really deep hole, you're filling it with things. It can be amazing things, but actually it's just, it's just not um, like going anywhere. And I just felt really like lost and that a lot of the really confusing emotions that I had, even just the fact that um um still like is it okay to still see your biological parents with your parents all these kind of things like i didn't know where to like channel them 
Channel Zero Two, um, and um, I I felt I thought that life accomplishments would help me feel a sense of like life satisfaction and life joy. Um, but it turned out that it it did. It provided me some layers, but I think um, matters of the heart are very different to your career. <laughs> yeah. And and so your career fills you a, a different kind of joy than your you making peace with who you are and um because i think that just for me once i nailed that everything else like amplified in my life i think yeah yeah okay thank you um linda said thank you so much for sharing your journey as a fellow adoptive person it's really helpful and encouraging to hear how you've been able to use therapy to address the traumas you experienced and heal to such an incredible force of inspiration and courage bless you and thank you so it's not really a question but just nice for you to hear thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, victoria said thank you for answering the question um and she really appreciates you saying about how sometimes it's not going to be the adoptive parent that's the person that the the child needs to to explore some parts of the heritage with and that's a really important thing to think about um uh, grace said it was so important to my son's biological mum that i know what products to use on his hair and skin and they understood his ethnicity i can imagine your biological mum would be so happy that your mum supported you in reference to your hair that was um, so again, that's not really a question, but just a nice statement. So I'm not having a chance to read all of these before um, in advance. Um, Sarah said, it's been so helpful to hear about your incredible journey. Thank you so much. As someone who is about to adopt, please may I ask how you feel towards your adoptive parents now? What's my, ooh. Um, so it is, um, it is, in a much better place than it was, but I think it's in a much better place because I'm in a much better place. Mm. And in terms of, I'm able to see the the beauties of adoption and also be in a place where I can accept within myself also the challenges that I have gone through. So um, I I love them dearly for everything that they have um provided and all the love they've they've they, uh, all the love that they've been able to provide um and now um i think especially now that i'm more in adulthood i think sometimes that relationship shifts for everyone yeah. in terms of yeah, how of you course. interact with your <laughs> how you interact with your parents it becomes more adult to adult rather than that kind of um mm. yeah like when you're a child so i think now is much more positive but it's it's positive because I've personally gone through that kind of journey to be um, stronger within myself. And that's, that's had an impact in terms of how I interact with those relationships. But I think before it was really hard because I, and this is gonna sound really um, uh, hard, or I don't know what the word is, um, that I really struggled to see my parents as my parents mm. for my whole childhood. I really struggled to associate that kind of love and attachment to my adoptive parents because I was still grieving so much my Rwandan parents, but not knowing how to vocalize. And it felt like these people had rocked up out of nowhere and just replaced them without anyone really asking my permission. <laughs> yeah. Really. And with me having very little choice in it. And I'm um, so um yeah it's been a it's been it's been a journey but i think now i can see the the appreciate the challenges of being an adoptive parent and appreciate it more so i come at a place with much more empathy with the things that we as um me my brother and my parents have gone through um and um i'm just yeah they've provided uh, like really strong foundations of like love and support um which has been incredible Mm. and I think it's really it's really great to have that honesty about those feelings because as an adoptive parent it's quite difficult to hear that your child or any child might feel that way but it's really important that we do hear it and that we can understand it and learn from it um because you know w without knowing that you're, you're kind of um playing the game blind a little bit aren't you as, as a uh -huh. parent um so that's what i said earlier like it's so important for us to be able to hear from people like yourself um who have gone through such a challenging journey such a challenging experience and um look at how 
eloquent and um, brilliant you can articulate that those feelings now because for a five-year-old or a ten-year-old or you know a child who's dealing with that trauma firsthand they're not going to easily be able to articulate that's why they're behaving that way or that's why they're feeling that way um you know and, and like i said as a, as a adoptive parent myself you know i have we have been going through the therapy with our son you know um he has had a year's worth of ddp therapy and all those kind of things but that doesn't fix anything that doesn't stop him from having those feelings or doesn't you know those feelings that he's having is still very validated the same as your your feelings have have been um yeah so i think it's just really great that we can kind of sit and share share those thoughts and and hear from it from i think what you said about validation that's the biggest that's the biggest thing because i think it's that validation even the validating even the emotions that are quite challenging for either mm. parties like the child or the adopted parents so i think otherwise you just end up feeling like really guilty for like i don't know like missing your biological parents yeah. or like feeling that you don't belong in the um in the family that you're in now even if you're surrounded with like love and um a life that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't been adopted because i'm very aware that my adoption gave me a ticket out mm. of rwanda at a time where the country was falling apart however i still when i was younger i could have given anything to have stayed in rwanda which sounds really ungrateful yeah. but <laughs> but well, it was just i yeah <laughs> like you said you didn't ask to be adopted did you you didn't ask for someone to take you out of that situation so that as a child i'm assuming you know i can only imagine the feelings that were were created because of that um so yeah it's such a such a complex thing and i'm sure we could talk about it for hours and hours couldn't we and and you know the number of questions that are coming in now i'm just conscious of time as well so are you okay for time if we just get through a couple more questions as well yeah that's fine you haven't got to rush off on the dot or anything um so a couple more questions come through um we'll try and get all of them done but if we don't then i do apologize um oh i've missed one now oh there was one question saying um does your brother mirror your feelings uh, on his upbringing um and, and you know has he had a very similar experience to you um, um so my brother hasn't gone back to Rwanda yet so we have had very um i've always had a really deep need to go back to rwanda even before i went and i think my brother was more like indifferent or neutral um so um his i've even though we've been you know adopted within the same circumstance grew up in the same family our experiences and our emotions around our adoption have been very very different and i think that's one of the things for to is to Kind of remind and note that if you adopt like siblings their experience will be different mm. because they're individuals um but i remember when i went back the first time round, and i was i had always like dreamt of me and my brother going back together to rwanda i thought that would be like the most beautiful like um like loop back to where we started and at the time that I was looking to go back, he didn't really have much interest. And then I was torn whether I wait for him to be ready or I go by myself. I ended up going by myself because actually, um, I, you can't, with something like that, you can't force someone to be ready yeah. to, to go through that. Because even when I went through that and I thought I was ready and the emotional mess that brought up, like you need to be ready, like you as an individual ready to take on whatever may happen and so um he is um he is he deals with emotions very differently i'm very emotive <laughs> and i'm learning that's not a bad thing i'm very like close to my emotions yeah. um, and so for him he obviously knows that he's from rwanda and he knows where he comes from and this kind of thing but he doesn't have that deep desire to to know what the country is like and this kind of thing we were meant to go back this summer um but obviously because of covid everything yeah <laughs> everything cancelled but we were gonna we had booked the flights the whole family so all five of us were gonna go back to rwanda and do like a trip back the 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 kind of journey back that they my parents did when they came to adopt us but 
as adults and then with my sister as well now which would have been a beautiful thing which would have been his first experience back but um obviously, obviously covid didn't happen but i'm i'm really now very much um that you know whenever my brother decides that he wants to go then i'll be ready to support him because that's one of the things that i wish i had had when i was when i did it that's someone who like came with me but it can't be just anybody it needs to be someone who really understands yeah. you and can really hold you and hold space for you um but we've had yeah we've had very different um our journeys with Rwanda are very very different um but that's kind of makes the beauty of it but he's always been um incredibly supportive even though he personally doesn't want to go back but he's always been such an incredible cheerleader for yeah. all the times I've gone back and especially the first time I went back he was phenomenal oh that's really good um okay so did you have an experience of name changes um particularly in and kind of your experience if if so of kind of the cultural ethnic backgrounds involved in name changing what do you mean by name changes sorry no. so um was your birth name changed i guess what they're asking is kind of was your birth name changed when you were adopted and how did that impact you if so ah uh, so um yes it was so my name louise wasn't my name when i was um in rwanda it was given to me when i was adopted um so um we still kept we still kept our our rwanda names in our passports which i think is a little touch but i really applaud my parents for doing Mm. It's so much, it might seem really minor, but it meant that it retained that kind of identity in a like legal format, mm. even though we got given our like our, our first names and our surnames um, from them. Um, so I used to like when I was younger growing up, always everyone referred to me as Louise. My brother, interestingly, he in secondary school everyone referred to him as his Rwandan name and I don't know what made him switch to making people asking people to call him his Rwandan name and I always used to look at him being like wow that's really brave <laughs> to yeah. do that um and that's a really beautiful thing to do that as well but for me I never really did I always got people to call me Louise and it was only until later especially with um after going back a few times that I added my um Rwandan name in my I'm like social media accounts and um I dropped my French surname, which could be controversial. It, it, I don't know if it'd be controversial, it'd be controversial if you ask my parents. I mean, I haven't dropped my my French surname in like a legal format, but on a public format, it's been really lovely to be able to reclaim my Rwandan name as part of my full identity. Mm. Um but I wouldn't no one refers to me as my Rwanda name um, in terms of like at work or anything, apart from some close friends, when they write close to me, they write, they write my full name and my Rwanda name and it always warms my heart when people do that. But there's only very few people who do because they're the special ones, but so it wouldn't be like a everybody kind of thing, but the ones that really know the importance of my Rwanda name when they do, I think it's just, yeah, it's just beautiful. Oh. That's good. Um, do you, do you mind sharing what type of therapy you had as an adult? So there's a lady who's um, said that she found out that she was adopted when she was age 24, and although it's still 26 years ago, um, you know there's still a lot for her to kind of process and and kind of unpack. And would you recommend a you know could you recommend a good starting point for adult therapy? I suppose from your personal experience, this would be. Um, my therapist was. So it wasn't kind of like, I know there's so many different therapies, except there's so many different types of therapies and that there, but I feel like my therapist was just like talking therapy. I don't okay. think she, she practiced a certain, maybe she did because she was like, she was trained to do it and had like, she got a PhD and everything. But um, I think for me, it just felt like a talking therapy. It was more of a conversation mm. rather yeah. than a, now we're going to try this exercise or now we're going to try like this mindfulness thing or next time please have a think of this it was more of a a, a safe space conversation to yeah. talk about all the complexities of my emotions thank you um and sorry on that anyone can call the adoption uk helpline and the, the helpline advisors can try and point you and signpost you in direction of um 
information and advice and guidance on kind of where to start on that journey of kind of seeking therapeutic support. So I would I would recommend kind of seeking out the Adoption UK helpline and um, the number is on the website as well. Um, and we can send that out as part of the follow up email to all the participants on this session. Um, OK, someone says I used to look over time because I realised it's five past one. Is that OK? You, Louise? It's five past one. Are you still OK for time if I ask? Yeah, I'm still OK. OK, I won't take any more questions now. So the ones I've got on my screen are the ones that we'll ask and that'll be it. Um, so someone, uh, Grace said, only a small percentage of adopted people um, enter higher education and go to university. Um, and obviously you mentioned that you'd been to university and you were a graduate. So did you have any challenges? Did you feel like you had accomplished something extra special because you're an adopted person and had graduated university? I don't know if that had even entered your head. Um. Do you know what? I think back then, um, the fact that I was adopted, I never saw it as a um, correlation to my academic mm. um, journey or choices. Um, I know statistically that that's probably more, that's, that's very prominent and there's a research around it for um, children that are in care. I know there's mm. a real like disparity of the the percentage of children that go into high, further, high educate, further education and higher education. Yeah. But for me, in terms of my adoption, I don't think that that had um, an impact. I've, I was always a really high achiever. And um, for me, because I was going through so much um, growing up with um, identity and family, um, the um, school was an escape. And it was my safe space. It was my space to like excel, be myself, um, and so that's how I, I feel that I really made the most of like going all the way. I mean, I haven't got a PhD or a master's. I stopped after the undergrad. <laughs> but, like, for me, for me, education was my escape and it was my space where I could really just um, discover so many different things. So yeah. I, I love, I love learning. But I don't think I had a correlation between adoption and my experience of going into higher education. Great, thank you. Um, Susan said, um, it's more of a comment than a question, but as an adoptive mum, her daughter has just had a baby and was very, she was very interested to hear your comments about thinking of having a baby and the importance of genetics and finding something of yourself and your family in your child. She said that her daughter has commented that when she had a baby, it was the first time she'd ever lived with someone who shared her genetics in that way. And that was really important. And yeah, I think that was a really interesting thing that you raised actually. Um, and probably not something that as adoptive parents we think about very often either the kind of whole genetics thing and kind of sharing a room with someone that shares your gen genetics so uh, thank you for sharing that insight as well yeah it makes a difference and one of the things that now the place that i'm in is when i have my own children is that um i want to um have a um a, a godmother or godparents that are from um Rwanda and have the Rwandan culture, they can speak fluent in Rwandan and everything so they can teach them what it means to be Rwandan because I've accepted that I won't be that person to give them that. It's heartbreaking because as a parent, well I'm not a parent now, but I feel as a parent in the future that is the most heartbreaking thing that you can't pass on to your children. But mm -hmm. I would rather them, I would rather that they get it from somewhere, someone that I trust and love um, rather than not get it at all, because I've gone through the not getting it at all, and it's really difficult to learn it when you're an adult. So I really, I I really want to make sure that they get they're surrounded with um, a sense of pride of where they come from, um, and I'll probably end up like having to learn it with them. <laughs> to be <laughs> honest, but I've accepted that I'm not actually the best person to um, induct them or 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 teach them about Rwandan culture. I don't know anything about like Rwandan food or um or all that kind of thing. And I'd rather them have a godmother figure that teaches them that. Mm. Um rather than them feeling that that part of them isn't like celebrated in the home. Um so yeah. Awesome. I think we'll leave it there. There's a couple of questions we haven't got to, so I do apologise if we haven't answered your question, but I'm just conscious of time um, and I've noticed that um, people are starting to drift off as well. So it's probably um, not drift off as in fall asleep, but kind of leave the, the, the kind That's of right. session. Um, I don't think anyone's fallen asleep, but it was, it's been so great and lots of positive comments and you've been really honest and kind of 
open with your answers to questions as well, which I really appreciate because I think it's been invaluable for people to hear from you. So thank you very much. Um, like I said, it has right. been no, thank you for coming. It has been um, recorded. So anyone that wants to watch it back, we'll share it on our um, website as well. Uh, lots of positive comments coming in. So um, it's, it's been really great. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. You are free to go. Louise, if you don't mind, hang on one moment. That would be lovely, just so we can wrap up. But everyone else, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and please do join us again for other webinars in the future. Um, and have a good rest of your Tuesday.